Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Sushil Jain from Apollo Hospital Indore, and we welcome you to this pre-conference webinar of IPSC 11th edition. Uh, International Patient Safety Conference has been uh, held uh, since last 10 years and, and uh, has served as a pl platform for exchange of ideas pertaining to patient safety across the world. Uh, the 11th edition of IPSC would be held at Bangalore on 23rd and 24th of February, where you'll have a chance to interact with global leaders in healthcare and patient safety, and they'll be exchanging their thoughts during the conference. It would be preceded by some pre-conference workshops on 21st and 22nd of February. You can find the details on the website www.patientsafety.co.n. You can have all the details as well as the registrations. Uh, the registrations are open till 18th of February 24. So we'll, I request you all to uh, please register well within time uh, and uh, look forward to see you in the, on the uh, 23rd and 24th February in the conference. Uh, now coming to the today's webinar, which is on the prospects and culture of safety, building trust and transparency. So workplace is safety is not just a set of rules. It is it is a shared mindset and a collective com commitment. So we have to ensure that everyone is involved in this commitment. And there are two, uh, two pivotal elements uh, for this, which is trust and transparency. And it is not an aspiration to build trust and transparency in the system. It is a necessity. So everyone has to be involved, every voice has to matter and concerns are addressed openly. And it has to be a collaborative effort. So I thank you all for joining in this webinar and uh, uh, I'll take the permission to start the webinar with Dr. Uh, Lieutenant General Dr. Bipin Puri. Uh, he will be the first speaker. So Lieutenant General Puri is uh, a pediatric surgeon uh, and has been a, uh, and his FI, FI, FRCS of Edinburgh University. He had many accolades to him. Um, he has been vice, uh, vice chancellor of the KGMU Lucknow, and for four decades he has he has served in the armed forces. Uh, during his service, apart from other other accolades, he has uh, received Param Vishesh Seva Medal and Vishesh Seva Medal. He had been chief of army commendation from 2001 to 2012. He has been general officer commanding in chief and plus many other accolades in during the during his tenure in the army and otherwise. Uh, he had also received presidential medal and plaque of honor honor uh, plaque. I'm sorry. So, uh, and a certificate of appreciation while, while he was uh, uh, the vice chancellor of KGMU Lucknow from the uh, from the honorable governor of Uttar Pradesh and the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh. He has been member of learned bodies, expert groups, and uh, advisory board over thirty renowned institutions of country, and has authored more than fifty research paper publications in reputed journals, international and national. He has delivered guests and invited lectures on in over 200 national and international conferences. Currently, he is the Director of Medical Services of Apollo Indra Plus Hospital and the Northern Region uh, of Apollo Hospitals Group. So I hand it over to Dr. Bipin Puri uh, to take up uh, the first topic. I will request the participants to put their questions in the chat box, which we'll take up in, at the end of the talks. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Puri. Uh, Dr. Puri, you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Clear. Okay. So thank you, uh, Dr. Sushil Jain, for this very kind introduction. And I would uh, want to begin with by thanking the organizers of the 11th um, IPSC conference, uh, Dr. Sanjay Dalsania in particular, and all the other uh, uh, organizing team. And um, um, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts on something which is very, very important in uh, as we look after um, leader in leadership roles, um, 
the when you're talking of culture of safety i think uh, uh, to me uh, i want to begin with by saying that uh, every institution has a different ethos and culture now so therefore it varies from institution to institution it varies from your leadership styles it also varies on your governance and what sort of governance you want to provide to your in institution it is with this uh, um, a few words i would now take you through a couple of slides to share some data some um, uh, relevant information about how to build um, a culture of safety um, in your organization and um, and then try and embrace trust and transparency in the system well i want to begin with by saying that patient safety continues to be a, a extremely important issue challenge um, um, in a hospital environment ecosystem but now look at this uh, we know for, uh, in the united states where they have stats where they talk about this um, uh, medication errors or hospital uh, uh, errors being the third largest cause of deaths in a hospital setting but um, here are some key facts one in every 10 patient is harmed in health in healthcare and more than 3 million deaths occur annually due to unsafe care so that's a, a huge volume um, uh, something which is uh, we'll talk about how much 50% of this is actually preventable so um, therefore there is a huge need for us to look into patient safety issues but and if you translate it into economic terms look at this now he says 0.7% uh, um, global economic growth um, is reduced by 0.7% in a year every year and accounts for about trillions of us dollars on a yearly basis so that's really is the quantum of um, economic impact that it can make these uh, patient safety issues problems challenges and thereof now let me take you through a couple of uh, uh, problems challenges in this in this story well as you know barriers to accidents in a hospital setting could be a good leadership policies procedures that you make your sops your um, uh, ways that you would want to implement your strategies Avail available resources you must have your your infrastructure you must have your human resource you must have your training and of course communication different types of communication at different levels be it a, a doctor to nurse nurse um, to technician technician to patient or in any order therefore whereas these roles are well defined these are barriers to accidents there may be holes and gaps in these uh, uh, barriers for example leader in leadership uh, there could be excessive cost cutting which might result in staffing reductions equipment shortages again because of budget issues communication lack of staff motivation divided or confused accountability now those are some of the things which uh, again as i said leadership governance styles now those are very very important issues and this is where uh, you as a leader have to decide what is going to what cost cutting is going to um, upset the entire apple cart for you as far as your performance is concerned talking of policies and procedures as you know that we must we must have a sops for various and strategies for every uh, aspect of our uh, uh, different for different verticals um poor compliance to policies poor coordination and communication can yet again be gaps in uh, this barrier as well available resources do you have the available resources do you have enough of training and training has to be repeated it's not a one time it has to happen yet again and again do you have ex experienced technicians now those could be yet again gaps you have the resources but are they good enough are they trained do are they experienced those could be 
again a, a challenge coming to communication fail to review allergy so history taking wrong x-ray marker wrong procedure performed now those can actually all of this as you see now if all of this happens if there um, uh, there's a leadership failure policy failure a will resources failure communication failure can result in accidents and injuries which may, may result in a wrong site injury a wrong site surgery medication errors or uh, falls in the hospital environment now these are failures in the system and they may occur if all of this there is a failure at different levels and that is why this is called a sweet a swiss cheese model of the explanation as far as um, uh, patient care patient safety is concerned so i am going to uh, uh, talk a little uh, give you a, some uh, uh, story about josie king and this of course is an anecdotal uh, where uh, this child was admitted with severe burns in uh, John Hopkins Hospital, um, be severe burns because um, she walked in into a hot bath. Uh, she was got into an ICU setting, and where she was uh, obviously she was critically ill in the critical care system. She um, had of course lines and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. She was a mid orderly of course because um, she had perhaps uh, she had burnt her um, um, esophagus as well. She was sucking feverishly at her, on her clothes and uh, she was advised nil orally. She was, uh, of course, the parents noticed there was some a problem. They complained to, this, to the nurse on duty. The nurse said, nothing, it's all well, nothing to do. So, but it wasn't good enough. Patient and family education, family concerns were not taken into consideration. Because the mother complained, the nurse said all is well, didn't work out. So um, verbal orders for nar narcotics were given. In um, uh, On paper, it was no narcotics to be given. Uh, but verbally, uh, as per the, the nurse, she was told that you can. So a, a dose of methadone was given to this child. And uh, um, the the child, after um, the in injection, had a cardiac arrest. And then, of course, there was mayhem. A patient had a CPR, was um, was put on a ventilator, and uh, different lines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, to make a long story short, the patient could not be revived, suffered a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and uh, two days later, the child died. Now, here was a situation where um, medication was given without being endorsed on paper, whereas it was told that this methadone was not to be given, narcotics were not to be given to this patient. And she had hospital, she had developed hospital fire infections, severe dehydration, and of course, uh, an inappropriate narcotic infusion. Now, I began noticing that every time she saw a drink, she would scream for it, and I thought this was strange. I was told not to let her drink. While a nurse and I gave her a bath, she sucked furiously on a washcloth. As I put her to bed, I noticed that her eyes were rolling back in her head. Although I asked the nurse to call the doctor, she reassured me that oftentimes children did this and her vitals were fine. I told her Josie had never done this, and perhaps another nurse could look at her. After yet another reassurance from another nurse that everything was fine, I was told that it was okay for me to sleep at home. Two days later, Jack, Relly, and Eva were brought to the hospital to kiss their beloved Josie goodbye. Josie was taken off of life support. She died in our arms on a snowy night in what's considered to be one of the best hospitals in the world. Tony and I decided that we had to let the anger move us forward. We would do something good that would help prevent this from ever happening to a child again. It seemed the best place to start was with Johns Hopkins. Over the past year and a half, we have worked with the hospital to create the Josie King Patient Safety Program. Together, we launched the program last week. Josie's death was not the fault of one doctor 
or one nurse or one misplaced decimal point. It was the result of a total breakdown in the system. It was the result of a complete lack of communication between the different teams. It was the result of doctors and nurses not listening to a concerned parent. It was the result of a combination of many errors, all of which were avoidable. 98,000 people die every year because of medical errors. Hospital errors are among the top four leading causes of death in the country. This problem is unlike cancer, AIDS, or other diseases where we must wait for a scientific breakthrough in order to save lives. Hospitals are a man-made epidemic. Nurses and doctors make mistakes and lives are being lost. These human errors need a human solution. You are the only ones that can solve this problem. So there it is, a, a, a man-made epidemic. We as humans are the ones who are required to solve our problems. These are problems that we create ourselves. And the question is, can we do it? But this is happening in uh, amongst the best hospitals in the in the world globally, John Hopkins Hospital. So, uh, what should we talk about other lesser uh, hospitals, lesser institutions in um, um, third world countries, in, uh, low income uh, countries, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So that's uh, the extremist point of view which I wanted to paint. But now let's move on to talk about what should we, what are we looking at? Are we looking at a safety program making as um, in your institution? Do you want to make safety programs or do you want a safety culture? Now there is a difference. There is a difference and what is the difference? Where, wherein, in, uh, if you want a culture is shared beliefs, behaviors and characteristics which are different, not forced. You can't push a culture. You can't push um, uh, rules and regulations. The, the Whatever the culture that you provide should be protective where everybody believes that there is uh, a rule to anticipate which will the management will support you with the rules and regulations. So it is protective. It helps you to, uh, to ensure and gives you a safe environment to work. It also remember a culture, a safety culture, would also should be inclusive, where there's a strong commitment and safety training for all the employees. So that's uh, where everybody understands what, why are we doing and what we are doing. Uh, so the, the what, why and where. So those are the issues, the questions which require to solve when as you move on this journey of safety culture and also uh, I think it's important that it should be integral. It should be an integral part of any safety culture that we talk about with a firm commitment at all levels of the management. So I think that's uh, really what we are looking at. We are not wanting to have a punitive culture. We are not wanting to have a punishment culture. We are and, and we want to be more communicative and uh, try and be as inclusive as possible. What is a safe culture? So uh, uh, we are uh, talking about commitment to safety in high-risk operations like ours at in the um, Apollo Hospital, which is a quaternary level um, uh, hospital, a multiple uh, centers of excellence, um, 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 high quality work going on. A huge amount of technology has come in, lots of do's and don'ts, every, transplants, uh, oncology, genetics, you name it, it's it's all there. So in this high-risk environment ecosystem, um, the chance of mistakes, chance of um, uh, risks that one takes are very, very high. And therefore, it's an ecosystem which requires to be monitored closely. But herein, promote a culture of error reporting and accountability. Errors will happen because that's human and fostering collaborative problem solving for patient safety enhancement and a dedicated organizational resource for addressing safety concerns. Now, that's the ecosystem that we are talking about to make a safety culture. Now, uh, somebody can ask, why do we need a good safety culture? We need a safety culture so that we are all 
in the managerial team, the quality team, we are alert to identify potential risks, hazards, uh, promote a safe, safe behavior where individuals can report errors. And I think that's important to make it conducive that I'm, I'm not afraid of reporting an error. We are proactive in establish, establishing mitigation measures. So in case there is a problem, you identify a challenge, you identify an area which requires to be worked on, you are proactively work on it and find solutions to the problem and have zero tolerance for reckless behavior, omissions, and uh, uh, something which, which is not acceptable. So I think those should be a good, a fairly good safety culture. What are the benefits of a, a positive safety culture? Decrease rates of injury or accidents, lower employee turnover, because obviously the employees are happy with you, there's uh, unlikely to be a turnover, high employee engagement, increased employee pro productivity, and of course, the organization is going to support you. So let me uh, uh, just uh, give you a small snippet here. Um, in the last seventh JCI, when we were interacting with the JCI team, which had come from the US, and they asked us how, uh, how many um, near miss or unsafe conditions or incidents are reported uh, annually in, in your hospital. So uh, the uh, the numbers that we talked about from our uh, list was about 1,000 plus was the numbers every year that we were reporting as a near miss incidents, et cetera, et cetera. What the JCI inspector said that is uh, uh, too low uh, to make it a, a safe environment. What should happen is that you should be reporting as much as, look at this now, this example that, that I have put up. This is what it is. Uh, three lakh times that you report an incident. It may be something very trivial, but yet you, you feel that it is something which requires to be reported. Near miss incidents, nearly about 30,000 in a year. 300 incidents. So that's the volume that you're talking about. And with this sort of a reporting, you may have as much as about 30, 30 patients may have some sort of a serious disability and one patient may be, may be fatal. Now, the point is that a good organization who reports, who reports fearlessly, and um, um, this is what the final answer is going to be. You, you may have a little bit of disability, you'll have very few fatalities, and I think that's what we are all looking at. So I think um, um, that is was an important issue, it, a, a thing which came up in the last JCI. And um, okay, so here was another story, and which is, which is another extremist uh, uh, sort of a policy, which I thought I picked up to just to share with you. Now this was this nurse Kimberly, and um, a nurse was caring for this infant. Um, and she uh, went through a medication error. It was critical and it resulted in death of the infant. The, the nurse, true that she was to her conscience, she informed about the error and in the incident to the treating physician, the unit in charge and the parents of the child that she had erred. The hospital decided to terminate her uh, employment after, and this was after 27 years of exemplary service of this of this nurse. Well, friends, ladies and gentlemen, this this nurse committed suicide seven months later after this incident. But just before her death, she obviously was absolutely brilliant, exemplary in her professionalism. It was a mistake that she had created. She had done. She and and she had aced an advanced cardiac life support certification exam just before she finally died, and uh, a, a few days after all this, she committed suicide. The question, the point here is, it actually jolts you. A, a person who is professionally very sound, exemplary, par excellence as far as uh, her um, academic professionalism is concerned, makes a mistake inadvertently. I think it's important to understand, um, do um, an RCA, try and understand 
plug those holes by which she made that medication error. But why take such extremist steps where this can result in um, um, a disaster of this nature? So, sorry. Sorry for this. Yes, Indiana. Yeah, so uh, coming back to um, uh, another very important statement I'm going to make, and that is the most dangerous phrase in, in our language is we have always done it this way. You know, very often in the hospital setting, when somebody is asked, why are you doing this procedure in the way? Why can't you do it a little better? Um, but the answer is, no, I've been doing it for years. And uh, I mean, like... So a status quo ante, don't want to change. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, I, it is important that we, as medical science continues to grow, evolve, change by the day, it's important that we pick up best practices from time to time, evolve in our understanding of disease, procedures, workflows, and uh, processes. I think that, to, to me, is important. And for us to keep growing as far, uh, uh, as, far as the the procedures are concerned is critically important in our science. Um, so why is there a resistance to change? Ask yourself, why is there a resistance to change? Resistance to change is because, could be because cultures, value traditions, different perspectives and goals. Everybody is on his own, his own individual way of looking. Lack of trust and understanding and of course, uncertainty that I don't believe that uh, this could be a better way. So all in all, all of this results in a resistance to change. But the point is, change, if you don't change, you, you land up in issues, you land up in problems. Now, the take is, if there's a human error, where you say that uh, I forgot to do this two hourly check of the patient who's critically ill. So you can manage these changes by processes, uh, 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 look at your processes, look at your procedures, training, design, environment. You can console the, uh, the employee and tell him that they, you have made an error, but uh, uh, at the same time, you must um, go through your processes, your procedures and SOPs, and your training, the training, the retraining uh, should keep emphasizing uh, uh, the points which are important and integral in, in the uh, stepwise process flows. Now, talk of another situation. I did a one-person transfer with, with a resident who required a two-person transfer because the resident needed to use the bathroom and everyone else was busy. Now, here was a risk, uh, at-risk behavior. The patient required care during a transfer. And during transfer, if something happens, it can be catastrophic. Therefore, removing incentives at risk, at, at risk behaviors, creating incentives for healthy behaviors, and increasing situational awareness are some ways to try and um, mitigate this problem. Therefore, coach, coach the employees and the trainees that this is how it should, uh, should happen. But if there is reckless behavior, for example, I knowingly avoided completing a treatment because it is complex and time consuming. So uh, really it's an act of omission. When you do knowingly an act of omission and you uh, discard doing a process flow and results in a disaster, then I think there is a need for us to do take some remedial action, maybe a disciplinary action, and take some punitive action. So that's uh, really the spectrum of um, a safety of culture that you would see in any institution. And that is what we do at in the Plus Apollo Hospital as well. As you can see, incident detection. Um, and uh, of course, uh, there is anonymous reporting. There's online reporting, um, uh, which um, uh, results in better analytics. There is um, um, uh, email trigger, 
and so the 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 tracker comes on and we know that there is uh, a, a incident has happened called the quality team comes in and there are the, so there are real time alerts to the quality team who come in and do a sack scoring and um, as as you know the sack scoring is a severity assessment code and based on um, the objective criteria depending on what is the scoring uh, in the sack scoring one would get in into a go ticket forwards to e either it's an action taken report or a rca if it is a sentinel event and of course mo move on to, uh, to the heads it moves to the uh, the heads of departments uh, who um, and this is where i say leadership at different levels are involved uh, to look at uh, assess why it has happened and try and analyze uh, the uh, the incident and then, of course, quality goes through it, goes through the action taken report or uh, the RCA, and then uh, take corrective action. So that's uh, really the entire gamut of activity whenever there is an adverse event or a sentinel event. And that is how we start the process of analytics whenever incidents happen. So therefore, uh, for a culture, for a safety culture, there are behavioral issues which means that there's a, there's a blame free environment so the employees know that it's not going to be a blame game that it can be a disaster the if i it's disclosed i have not washed my hands i have seen those people are not washing their hands they are going into the into uh, into the icu from one patient to the other and uh, so a blame game so if i do a reporting if I, and I come to know that it's, it's, uh, some action has been taken against me because I've reported, I, tomorrow I will not report at all. A psychological component refers to what individuals think about uh, their opinion, belief about their environment. If I know that in my environment, my hospital is um, just carries you with you, they want you a, a good culture, they want to inculcate good uh, do's and don'ts, there is no punitive action. It helps you uh, uh, the, improve the ethos and culture of no harms, no harm for the patient. I think that really is what we are trying to um, uh, push forward. And of course, the organization, it also the, there's an organizational component wherein the organization looks at the attitudes, perceptions of workers, uh, safety related behaviors of individuals and environmental structures and processes within the organization to help the procedure, the, the work environment and make it a, a nice ecosystem. Now, I need to emphasize that uh, uh, any quality standards, be it the NABH, and you can see um, 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 it, we have noted down PSQ6 from the NABH and GLD 13 and 13.1 all emphasize the importance of patient safety and a safety culture in the work environment. Now that's really the importance. All accreditation uh, institutions emphasize um, uh, this aspect as being hugely important. Now, uh, um, so this is how it is. How do you evaluate um, um, risks in your workplace? First, of course, is evaluate the risk. You have, there has been an incident. You evaluate the risk. You set goals, include everyone in the decision-making, all stakeholders in the process, determine responsibilities, implement a training curriculum, communicate and report, exchange feedback, and continue improving. So that's really the whole cycle that whether it is the initial strategy or it is a strategy which you evolve when an incident has happened. In both scenarios, this is uh, how one would uh, evolve a risk mitigation strategy. As we are all aware, there are some tools by which you can measure patient safety culture of an institution um, uh, I'm told that we at, at the Apollo hospitals, we follow the AHRQ uh, um, quality standards um, and uh, this um, or some, some amendments from the main one, but this is what it is. But uh, others are using uh, from the John Hopkins Hospital, their uh, questionnaires and some, of course, are using the Manchester Patient Safety Assessment. But all of them, if you look at 
all of them, what are they trying to analyze from your cultures? Uh, com- do you have communication about errors? Do you have communication openness? Do you have a hands-off and information exchange? Do you have support for patient safety? Do you have organizational learnings? And do you talk about them? Do you have a reporting patient safety events that how you saved a patient because of your um, uh, strategies? Response to error, error was committed and how did, how was the response of the organization? Staffing and workplace, what is the ethos of this, your staffing and workplace? And supervisors, managers, or clinical leaders, support for the patient, and of course, teamwork. And as I said, I actually touched about each one of these in my earlier projections, but that's uh, a objective data of all of these standards is then taken to, to compositely measure what is um, how much of safety uh, objectively in your safety. Uh, in your work environment. What should be the action plan if there is a problem, uh, uh, there has been a meeting, there has been an adverse event, a central event, what should be the action plan? So this is uh, how it is, uh, form an action planning team, develop your action plan, plan your improvement initiative and communicate your action plan. So this is really um, um, uh, the uh, the way one would go by and uh, of course uh, what are we are looking at your what areas do you want to focus on your improvement look at your lowest scoring results decide on the areas to focus focus on your improvement what are your smart goals remember smart here means specific measurable achievable relevant and time bound and set your smart goals that will help you to see the gap between where you are and where you want to be. So I think it's important when you make your action plans to to try and see where you are and where you want to be and then do this gap analysis and then find ways how you're going to mitigate your your challenge. What initiative will you implement? What resources you will need? What are the possible barriers which you will have to overcome? Will you do a pilot? before you actually implement the uh, the initiative or will you make how will you make measure your progress and success and what is the timelines now this is how you define the contours of your entire um, action plan and this is how uh, we would do it at in the bus Apollo hospital communicating communicating i sincerely believe with whether how you communicate to your environment your ecosystem whether it's by meetings, newsletters, emails, uh, posters, bulletins, and staff representatives. This is how it, it, it should um, disseminate information, knowledge, whatever action plan, plan that you've made must be disseminated by different methodologies to, so that it's widely known and uh, universally known by, by one and all. Um, just a picture to show you fostering the safety culture environment, leadership, getting involved with everybody, be it nurses, technicians, pharmacists, um, uh, doctors at at different levels. So this has been always been a a policy, a procedure, a process that we uh, which we continue to uh, push forward. And uh, uh, look at this. Uh, uh, This is, of course, the pharmacist. He says that I'm empowered to withhold the dispensing of reserve antibiotics until obtaining appropriate approval. That's the empowering. I can question if medication dosages seem unusual or potentially harmful. So here again is empowering the pharmacist. I can provide substitutes in discussion with doctors instead of a particular drug brand. So branded drugs, when when you're talking of branded drugs. As for the doctors are concerned, I'm empowered to initiate discussions with my colleagues about their treatment plans. I'm empowered to immediately report any equipment malfunction or irregularities in patients' monitoring devices. So that is really empowering your doctors, your pharmacists and nurses. I'm empowered to advocate for patient safety by speaking up about any observed deviations. I'm empowered to ask doctors to wash hands before doing any uh, aseptic procedure 
and I'm also empowered to pause a surgical procedure until the surgical safety checklist is thoroughly completed. So that, friends and ladies and gentlemen, is really what we mean, that if you have to hold hands of your employees, tell them that um, you are empowered to do this, and the, the, the senior person is not going to question you. He will just thank you for reminding him for whatever you have done. So I, uh, in conclusion then, some take-home messages, good governance and inclusive leadership will continue to be, I, I think, a, a, a overarching, an overarching aspect when we talk of a safety culture in any institution. I think it's very important as leaders, as leaders to collaborate, innovate, and encourage your employees to take risks. Risk doesn't mean that uh, you're uh, wanting them to make mistakes. But remember, when you make mistakes, you actually are uh, giving them a learning how to improve from your mistakes. And that, to me, is from your failures. If you fail and then you learn from your failures, I think that really is um, uh, in a leadership style. I think it is an, a fantastic thing to happen. Report for a safety culture report without fear. I think that is yet another a very, very important environment, um, um, tangible to ensure, teach, caution, coach, and punish rarely, as I've already said in my projections, conceptualize, action plans, strategize, implement, and communicate, disseminate information, um, from top to bottom uh, so that your uh, your strategy, your SOP, your ethos, your culture is uh, spreads far and wide. And of course, as leaders in our governing styles, uh, we must have an eagle's eye and a warm heart when we look at uh, our, our, our employees' uh, uh, behavior and their uh, challenges. With these few words, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your listening and thank you um, as all of us make efforts to improve our workplace. I once again uh, thank uh, the uh, organizers of this webinar for allowing me to share some of my thoughts. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant General Puri, for this superb talk about uh, the building up of culture of safety in the organizations and and yes to uh, people should come out with the errors they are committing or they are observing so that it's not sh showed under under the carpet and it comes out and we can always go back and do analysis and make corrections in our course so that uh, uh, there are no further errors and we that's how we develop the culture uh, safety culture uh, without wasting any further time i'll as uh, switch over to the next speaker, Dr. Sanjeev Singh. So, Dr. Sanjeev Singh is the uh, is a pediatrician and a mas master's in hospital management and a PhD in infectious diseases. He's a he has fellowship in patient safety from University of Mar Virginia, health technology assessment from University of Adelaide, and health qual healthcare quality, uh, the in International Society for ISCOR uh, for the quality assessment. He has worked as a regional coordinator in WHO. He is chief of medical services at Amrata Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. He has a number, uh, number of awards uh, accorded to him. Uh, he has uh, around 132 national and international publications to his credit. He is a faculty at IIM Kolkata and Bangalore. And he has 14 research projects with a grant of close to 49 crores. So I invite Dr. Sanjeev Singh to take up the second topic. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. And uh, Lieutenant General Bipin Puri, sir, we have uh, heard your name and uh, we heard your session. It was my first interaction. Uh, excellent. Uh, the passion with which you delivered, it is so reflective and uh, so touching that I think this is where, this is how the quality or patient safety journey should start. So thank you so much for delivering such a fantastic lecture and uh, 
a, a great uh, show from Apollo Group of uh, Hospitals. So I'm going to talk about uh, culture of safety, the trust which has to be built in, uh, healthcare worker safety, facility safety, and patient safety. There are three aspects of safety culture. And uh, would like to not delve where uh, Lieutenant Journey Puri sir has already mentioned. So these are some of the references for my talk. I'll start on a personal note. She's my wife. She's a professor of anesthesia and a palliative medicine doctor. And she had a biliary sludge and uh, <clears throat> was doing her post-graduation uh, and went for doing at the very, very reputed, the most prestigious institute in the country. And with the most prestigious gastroenterologist, we got an appointment for an ERCP. So day zero, there was an ERCP which was done. They went into the ampulla of waiter and injected the dye and they didn't realize that they did. They were not in the bile duct and they were in the pancreatic duct. So I'm not talking about day one, day two. I'm talking about month one and month two. So month one, it was a complete hemorrhaging, necrotizing pancreatitis and we know it's so destroying, devastating and painful. Month two, developed subcolic abscesses and septicemia and the 105 fever every day. <clears throat> Day three, month three, uh, burst abdomens, multiple surgeries performed, all multidrug resistant organisms, nil per orally since, uh, since day one. Day month four, pericardial effusion, pleural effusion, everything under the sun which was expected. There were 16 post ERCP pancreatitis which came in in the critical care unit beside her bed. All of them conked off, all of them succumbed. Month 5, jejunostomy, persistent high-grade fever, tachycardia, high BP. Month 6, ambulant, we were fortunate that she was she came back home and she was hospitalized for 6 months in a critical care, a bill of 1.2 CR. The issue is, why should this happen in the best of the setup in the country, with the best of the hands, with the person who himself is a, a medical professional and we realize that when the procedure was done, being a professor of anesthesia, there was no sedation. There was no short GA which was given for the procedure. And since they don't give GA or a short or a sedation, they want they would like to do the surgery or the procedures very very fast. And they don't realize where they have entered during the whole uh, <clears throat> process. Risk assessment very very high. Could this have been avoided? Is there an assessment pattern? Is there a management? Everything could have been done and why you should fall under 0.3% of post-ERCP pancreatitis risk at all. So big centers, things can go wrong. Best of the hospitals, things can go wrong. Medical professional, you know, and it can go wrong. So Ernest Emery Cotman, he was uh, a surgeon at Harvard Medical School. Remember the year 1917, almost a decade, almost a century back, he was saying, Every hospital should follow every patient it treats. He's not talking about a procedure long enough to determine whether <clears throat> or not the treatment has been successful. Right now, what we generally do, every physician has their success rate, either for a solid organ transplantation or a knee replacement. It's all 95% and above. What he's saying almost a century back, is the patient is the one who's going to decide your success and it is just not physician driven. So what do we do? Is there a tool available? There are, which is um, International uh, Healthcare Confederation of Outcome Monitoring, which has built in two tools, which are called as patient reported outcome measures and patient re uh, reported experience measure. So can we build in that tools? So what Professor Puri was mentioning was so important that those Culture has to be set in and there are mechanisms and tools which can be also adopted to do that. Let's take an example from other industries. So what do they do? So when they are innovating, there is this gentleman who in a, uh, was attending a meeting at Paris, wanted to, um, when the meeting got over, John Travis, he wanted his vehicle to come in, which could not come because it was raining cats and dogs. And he was thinking why on a click of a button, he just cannot get another vehicle to go back and uh, meet the other schedule. 
and there is where the idea came in and that's how the culture of safety should also come in and that we can be learn from other industries so he built in on a on an online platform built in one of the most seamless mechanisms of value proposition which are very very high <clears throat> he built in extreme good channels he also built in what is uh, called as key partners it is just not one person driven he also built in resources he built in revenue streams surge pricing so that there is a business plan and also built in a culture of safety among those who are partnering there could be one of all these incidents but then that is how it is a multi cent multi country projects and it is so important to also get customer feedback to be able to keep delivering what you need to deliver so is there a culture and is there safety linked to that is what is important and affordable prices is the key and that is where it is also important for healthcare at least in india and we should learn that from uber we can learn that from netflix change the whole culture of how <clears throat> we used to see movies and series it's all there available on the or, or with you so what how does google define culture it's basically looking at social behavior building institutions building norms linking human societies with the all with the idea of knowledge belief art laws customs and habit so it's it's a pretty large collective programming of human mind which is the most difficult thing because as a as a manager most of our time just goes into mind management and uh, looking at conflict resolutions and that is where this culture of safety is so critical i'm not going to give example of airline i'm not going to give example of kitchen i'm not going to give example because you have heard that for almost two decades in a in a jungle we also needs to have a culture which is safe so we need to be watching out so if there is a gazelle which wakes up at 4 p 4 am at uh, masai mara in nairobi he knows he he is going he has to run to be able to save his life and even the royal Bing, royal tiger which wakes up at 4 am he also knows he has to run to be able to save his life and that is where you build in an important aspect which is watching out which is having a sense of the belongings how do you create a culture and that to safe <clears throat> you also need to know that at 4 am you wake up you need to run to sort of protect yourself you need to report if there are any movements which are not favorable need to report and that is what we need to do all of it in a healthcare institutions we need to keep guiding each other because there is a collective mechanism collective programming of mind games so mentoring and guiding is extremely important learning there are lots of i was there in kochi for almost 19 years i am now here in faridabad uh, a very difficult place i'm unlearning a lot of things and learning a lot of new things and that's how the, the the things are very very different sharing is also important and then ultimately team behavior so how do you create that kind of a safety culture is all about this an instinctive behavior and put that in process ultimately the question which we need to ask is what is ikigai of all of us that means what is a purpose <clears throat> in a uh, of our lives so why have we taken healthcare why we became why chose to become a doctor or a nurse or a healthcare professional that ikigai moment is extremely important what is the purpose and asking why is extremely important for us and that is where we lead to those seven pillars of patient safety and there is a safety culture <clears throat> i was walking across a, a central town a central square at madrid beautiful place i saw a few people who were selling bags <clears throat> they came from african country and it was a very nicely uh, a, a, a short uh, shopping uh, area which was there in the central madrid and all of a sudden i saw that they all vanished and i was thinking why because they are all there they were in large numbers fantastic bags people were buying because the police people had come over now if that can happen in uk it definitely happens in india and that is where the point is 
that until unless there is a policemanship or supervisory ship we don't work and that is where we miss the boat because the culture of safety has to be 24 by 7 into 365 days and not just when a supervisor comes in i like to bring in a culture uh, a, a, a topic of innovation because how is it just the same story of medication error is it just the same story of uh, critical care downtime of biomedical equipment or is it the same story of ventilator associated nap or can we innovate can we think differently can we say that yes let's throw some ideas and do some issues which are bothering us and bring in operational efficiency and bring in a, a culture of safety so alexander fleming's idea is been taught at harvard school it is just a idea which brought in uh, a huge revolution so uh, getting a new idea networking and nexus is what is innovation it's just not about one new idea doesn't mean that you are innovating what happened is that he grew staphylococcus aureus and he left and went for a 3 weeks vacation when he came back he realized that some of the staphylococcus aureus have been eaten up and definitely there was a fungus which grew in and then he saw that basically it is so important to understand that if there is a fungal growth you can <clears throat> basically kill uh, a, a a a bug which is causing uh, surgical site infections which is causing lobar pneumonias and you can save life but that was just an idea what do you do with an idea nothing so he brought people together he got his friend henry howard flory idea became a nexus and then he published it he saw some of it happening in the crimean war that the people are dying he got the people together so nexus becomes as network because just one single idea doesn't work at all and then they all of it came together and said that yes penicillin is something which we need to try then there are people dying can we save them this became a huge movement they started producing large scale penicillin and they could only produce 40 vials <clears throat> but the 40 vials saved lives of the soldiers it that became an industry and then it became a huge industry where penicillin was produced and it revolutionized the way the infections or healthcare associated infections were treated just a single idea doesn't work so in a culture of safety just one single idea or being a copycat of uh, some other hospitals have followed it doesn't work so then they started making 4000 400000 vials 80 million vials 4 billion vials and that is where innovation nexus and networking works the design thinking is extremely important and this is where this is a fantastic tool for building a culture of safety which should be definitely practiced whenever i show this slide everybody says that we have been doing this for almost 20 years in our hospital what the big deal so this is just this gentleman who brought in this concept 2009 he published it in nagm and every hospital every accredited hospital follows it so what's the big deal the big deal is the eight hospitals which are participating in surgical safety safety checklist they showed a reduction of mortality of 3.2% using this checklist they showed a reduction of morbidity of 2.8% and they showed reduction of surgical site infection of 2.1% none of the indian hospitals have shown any such data they are all doing it for doing sake and it is just a tick box which every patient go, uh, every uh, operation theater goes through and that is the culture unfortunately documentation heaviness has led to a, a, a freaking out of safety culture i'll just touch this this is a uh, evidence uh, standard and there is a stronger evidence and there is a weaker evidence i was doing an assessment of a of a hospital of a, a very renowned medical college and i went to the uh, orthopedics ward i was with a professor and i saw a case that was a long uh, bone fracture and i asked what did you do he said he did an intramedullary nailing and then i looked at the drug chart i said what did you give he gave meropenem i said why he said that's what he has been giving for 10 to 15 days all patients go home he gave second drug was piperacillin tazobactam i asked him why he says because he is not 
comfortable with one antibiotic, so he gives two. And same mechanism of action, gram negative, he is giving two. Uh, I asked uh, the third drug that was injection tramadol. I asked him why. He said, because the, it's a long surgery, don't you know the patient has pain? I asked the patient, do you have pain? Patient said, no. The fourth drug was injection on Decentron. I asked him why. He said, whenever you give tramadol, you have to give on Decentron. I asked the patient, do you have nausea? Patient said, no. The fourth, the fifth drug was five pints of normal saline. Normal saline has been declared as abnormal almost a decade back. I asked him why. He said, everybody who gets admitted gets an intravascular fluid. Sixth drug was injection MVI. And I asked him why. He says, the patient wants to feel powerful when they see a yellow colored fluid getting in. And that is where we generally are, even in our teaching institutions, which is the weakest of the evidence which we practice. It is experience-based, opinion-based, and eminence-based. And that is where we don't create a culture because we don't want to innovate, we don't want to learn, and we don't want to follow evidence-based practice, though everybody can give almost an hour of lecture. Now, let's introspect. We run a very large uh, institute. 25 years into cardiac and our flagship programs are cardiac programs. We introspected our own work and we, we looked at our heart failures. 6.43 average length of stay, <clears throat> 4.2 given by American Heart Association. Daily weight, we thought we are running, there are 15 consultants, there are 8 postgraduates, DM cardiologists who are taken. Big department, 30 to 40 procedures done, uh, a large cardiac services. We thought 100% of them would be taking daily weight, not taken. Angio with an RFT, 33%. A good biomarker for heart, heart failure is pro-BNP. We thought it is done to be able to diagnose that patient of heart failure 61% of the time. ACE and ARB inhibitors are the drug of choice. We thought it's given for 100% of the patient, 55% given. At the time of discharge, you need to continue with ACE and ARB 40% of the time. You just need to take daily weight and give dietary consultation. We thought we are doing it for 100% of the case, done 42%. Basic. Back to basic. And when we introspect our work, we realize that we thought we are running a flagship program and people should learn from us. And then you realize that uh, it's no good. And that is where the culture of safety, and I'll skip this in the interest of time, is important. Antimicrobial stewardship is another program which we are very proud of. We are a multidisciplinary program. We have followed a Donabedian model of structure, process, and outcome. All what you see in blue is structure. All what you see in green is process. And then we keep measuring our outcomes once you put a structure and process in place. And it's all run by a clinical pharmacist. And uh, we've published this extensively. What I wanted to drive to in a culture of safety is communication. And this is one of my PhD students who have done this work uh, in South Africa and, uh, and it's extreme. We shadowed doctors on rounds. And the left-hand side, what you see is a patient bed and the and the clinical team doing rounds. We are a university teaching hospital at Kochi, <clears throat> not for profit. And you realize that still the rounds are hierarchical in nature. The senior surgeon, when he speaks, nobody else speaks. And we thought that it is a patient-centric design, but in India, it is very much carer-centric and then a patient-centric design because carer participates more than in revealing information or getting information and transmitting it to the patient. And we drew this heat map and you realize that <clears throat> most of the communication which has to happen from the, from the team is not happening. Though every good clinician believes he is the God's gift to mankind and the best communicator in the world. And that is where we showed this diagram to the clinical team that this is what you communicated today. And we started changing their behavior because they also never realized that they are not communicating what needs to be communicated to the carer and to the patient. And this is where this drawing is <clears throat> on what needs to be done. And we published this in Frontiers of Social Science, which is a very, again, a high impact uh, journal. It is also important to cost whatever you do. What is the medication error cost? So for us in our hospital is 23,000. One medication error is 23,000 rupees. 
one DBT profile axis not followed and pulmonary embolism is 2 lakh and 14,000 rupees. One hand hygiene not practiced, one surgical site infection is 51,000 rupees. Until unless there is a cost attached to the quality and or cost to the poor quality, the culture of safety will not come in. And we costed even antibiotic stewardship to bring in this practice. And our gains of good practice is close to 7 crore of rupees just in uh, in in three, in three years so <clears throat> it is extremely important to look at the opportunity and follow that so what do we do i'll end in uh, two three slides more there is a royal college of psychiatrists and psychologists and they had said how do you change so change happens only in this pattern one is pre-contemplation a, a notice would have gone to you that there would be a webinar and Dr. Sanjeev Singh will also speak. First is pre-contemplation. You want to see Singh who has a turban. And you don't have a turban, so who is it the right person? But he's coming from Kochi. So how will Kochi know what the rest of the India practices? So there's a lot of pre-contemplation which happens. Then you start listening. And then you realize that there are newer things, innovative things, there needs to be an entrepreneurial approach. There could be a lot of things which could also be done. That's contemplation. Then you start preparing. You were very relaxed during the process. And then when you get two, three good ideas, you start preparing yourself. Then you start taking action. Maybe you have taken one or two notes that tomorrow, maybe we can practice that. And then there is a maintenance. So what I'm coming to is every healthcare worker keeps complaining that I have sent an email, they don't follow. I have done a training, they don't follow. I gave this information, but they don't follow. Lab complaints to nursing, nursing complaints for the doctor, doctor complaints for the remaining of the staff. It is not going to work at all because the culture of change, according to the Royal College of Psychiatrists and Psychologists, will only work in this pattern. So until and unless we change ourselves, every individual change, the change is not going to happen. And similar thing happens for an institute. So there is a mechanism. One male, one idea will not be built. It has to basically come from every individual who practices. So this is my uh, penultimate slide. That it is extremely important to be psychologically safe. So create an organization culture where you have recognition and award. You have a growth pattern for each employee. Make it psychologically job fit for them. Cre create a balance, an engagement model. Protect them from psychological stresses. Protect them from physical stresses. Protect them from emotional stresses. Provide that kind of a leadership where you are looking for excellence and not just day-to-day -day work. And that is the culture which you need to set in. So there are various components and I'll skip that. And there are various tools I'll skip because a lot have been covered. So this is in summary that there are tools which are they are available, which are quality tools, which are management tools, which you can practice. You need to also do a staff survey because you need to know where you are. You need to also understand from various social media and other areas that what are the complaints and where, where are the gaps. Look at the incidents. But what is also very, very important is we cannot change if we don't measure. So we need to document every step of it. Innovate yourself. Uh, every individual also needs to change to bring that culture of safety and there are learning from other industries which we also need to adopt. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure listening to uh, Lieutenant General Puri and it was very nice to basically participate in Apollo's uh, webinar and thanks for this opportunity. So thank you, Dr. Sanjeev Singh. Uh, it was really interesting insights uh, over the same topic and uh, uh, presented in a very different way. So it was really a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, in the interest of time, because we have already overshot the time by nine minutes, nine, uh, nine and a half minutes, we'll not take up the questions right now and I'll ask the participants to uh, clarify their doubts in person during the IPSC conference, which is going to be held at uh, Bangalore Grand Sheraton uh, on 23rd and 24th uh, of February. So uh, with that, I'd uh, like to take this opportunity to thank Lieutenant General Puri and Dr. Sanjeev Singh 
for these excellent excellent presentations and uh, giving us the the perspective different perspective to the topics uh, i also thank dr sanjay for coordinating every uh, the webinar and the ipsc the whole ipsc team to put this to the ground thank you everyone thanks a lot thank you so much